let's try this again. We, uh, I recorded yesterday's episode, uh, went to upload it, did all the work, and the sound was not there. I can tell them right now the sound is working. We are going to get into the win yesterday. We're going to get into an idea I had that I thought personally was kind of fun. I'm curious to hear what everyone else has to think. We are going to talk about Oscar Gonzalez as this has become a controversial part of the episode. And we're going to talk about the Elvis Andrews tree tweet. We're going to talk a little bit about Gaddis and Curry and their promotions. And we have to mention the bit of Zach Plesak agency news on today's Locked On Guardians. <laughs> You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Locked On Guardians. I'm your host, Jeff Ellis. As I have been for all near 800 of these episodes. Uh, before that, I was a lead draft and prospect analyst. It's out in 24-7. And before that, I wrote for many a Cleveland sports blog. Just switched to the hat. Uh, so again, I recorded a whole episode. It was about, well, it got very loud there. It's about one in the morning my time. I have to wake up to teach and uh, no sound. So I apologize that this one is coming up in the evening instead of the afternoon. I'm then going to immediately record the Friday episode if you want to hear about the White Sox game, that's going to be more in the second episode. Let's start out first. Let's get this out of the way. People are very mad at me about my Oscar Gonzalez statements. I think Oscar Gonzalez should be written in an ink for next year in the outfield. You can always scratch it out if it doesn't work. But right now for me, my view on this team, Straw, Quan, Gonzalez, there's enough data with each of those players to say they deserve a le- longer leash. So, and for all the people who are mad, it's like, listen, I was one of the first people who wrote about Oscar Gonzalez. Uh, he follows me, I think he follows a lot of people on Twitter, but he followed me very early in his career when he's still just a, someone in A-ball. Uh, I talked about, before he got promoted, why it's time to give him a chance. And, you know, uh, beyond all of that, it's, it's the fact that no one expected this. No one could have expected this. I had zero people you know, DMing me, tweeting at me about how he needed to be part of this outfield until spring training. And it's just a reminder that, like, this team chose to protect 12 players. He was not one of them. He could have left as a minor league free agent. There are reasons why one is allowed to doubt a player. (laughs) Uh, He has done enough, though, and especially, like, it's very... We'll see how it goes. Again, with the power, with him tapping into it, you have a greater hope that maybe he is a Salvador Perez type. Uh, you know, there was Matt, um, God, I'm blanking on his name, who, you know, as a writer, had a great tweet where it showed, you know, typically major league pitchers are very good at identifying what hitters can handle, <laughs> i.e., why, if you haven't thrown a changeup in five years, you're still throwing Jose Ramirez a changeup. That is a pitch he does not do well on. That is the whole, the book is out. If you look at the list of guys who've seen the most sliders this year, it is deep dark blue, which is bad and then there's a red uh, Oscar Gonzalez so I'm curious to see apparently I mean he hits sliders very well so I'm curious to see you know after a full year of data because guys get hot right this happens you know I talked about it's very into a degree similar reminded me of Kareem Garcia back in the day but you're absolutely making this guy it's not like I'm stating uh, it doesn't ignore what he's doing no I love what he's doing appreciate what he's doing uh, and people who think I want him to fail, absolutely not. Listen, I think it's silly when people comp him to Vladi because Vladi was such a unicorn. But the other side is for him to succeed, he has to be a unicorn in his own right. Uh, own right. I believe in him being a, at least a fourth outfielder. The physical tools are there. Uh, and here's the thing. I have hit on enough things that if I'm wrong on him, I'm going to be happily wrong. It's not like... Uh, I'm sitting there. I mean, think about the people who, who say that uh, I get too braggy about the things I get right. Uh, you know, I also acknowledge, like, listen, I'm going to be making Cord Phelps jokes till the end of time because I thought he was the real deal. Uh, Dorses Paulino, I was huge on. That that didn't work. Uh, there are those guys who I've bought in and my success and failure, but I'll put my, my rate of success versus failure against anyone's. And listen... I I think 
that Oscar Gonzalez has earned being viewed as a starting outfielder for next year. And you know what happens if he goes out and he succeeds? Then he's another unicorn. And again, this team already has Tristan McKenzie, who's a unicorn, and Emmanuel Classe, who's a unicorn. This is a team built around unusual talent. So you're fine with it. It could happen. I'm not even saying replace him. I'm not even saying look to upgrade him. I think keep the outfield as it is. Call me crazy. There's enough to show that Straw could rebound. And worst case scenario, I have a hard time seeing Stephen Kwan fail. Seeing a route to that. But let's say Straw and Gonzalez don't work. Well, hopefully at some point by next year, you're counting on Valera stepping up. You're counting on maybe Nolan Jones playing some outfield. You're counting on some of those other pieces and players. I think you hold tight with this current team. And again, I would gladly have people clipping uh, audio clips of me doubting Oscar Gonzalez for the rest of my life and him become a great, great player than than me be right. I would much rather be wrong. And, And again, it's not even me saying it's impossible. It just, it is a hard profile with that walk rate. And like I said, right now, I'm taking a lot of grief, but it reminds me of the Ahmed situation. I took a lot of grief over that, and now he's back to being average-ish. And Oscar Gonzalez could be like Ahmed, it, it, but with more power, which makes him more valuable, which gets him closer to being someone like Salvi. It, it's going to be something interesting to watch, and this is my long way of saying, like, I don't hate any of these players. I, you know, I think there's pathways to success, but it's always interesting how much people get so defensive of certain players. And more than anything else, like, I really want to be wrong on Oscar Gonzalez because this team needs right-handed bats in the worst possible way. Uh, they just do. You know, listen, the Fran Mill situation is the Fran Mill situation. They weren't happy the last two years with his conditioning, if you believe internal, external reports. Uh, they weren't happy with some of the, you know, they wanted him, I think, to make some steps to becoming a better fielder, and the time wasn't put in. But they still miss that right-handed bat. That's what they miss, and that's why... I want Oscar Gonzalez to be successful. I hope Oscar Gonzalez is successful. And I want no part uh, about, uh, of, you know, people thinking that I'm rooting against him because I'm not. Like I said, I got enough, I got enough receipts that I don't need to be right on this. And I, no one's going to be right about everything. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Big deal. Move on. I've still got uh, enough, enough in the bank. I'm not concerned. Uh, In terms of, the uh, I want to look at my notes very quickly, even though I've already, like I said, recorded this once. So the other thing I talked about yesterday, and it still holds to a degree, is the fact that Cleveland has a division lead. There's no game 163. That means that if you are the Guardians, and right now it looks like they're going to win their division series against the White Sox and the Twins, even with the loss today, uh, it's essentially like having a extra game. So instead of being up three in the division, they're up three and a half they have some wiggle room because there's no more tiebreakers that doesn't exist anymore it just goes to head to head so cleveland yeah today is disappointing like i said that's gonna be more episode two we're gonna talk about the angels game uh in the second part of the show but i i think the one thing that i can't stress enough is actually this lead is bigger than you think and don't don't get too stressed and we will talk a little bit not a little bit we're going to talk about the angels game we're going to talk about zach plesak being let go by his agency and how that's kind of different uh in a moment on lockdown guardians if we are making a mount rushmore of sponsors of this show you got blue chew as the first right and one of the long ones we have the two longest of bet online and built bar and the other one we have to really kind of sit down debate and think about uh but right now let's talk about one of those mount rushmore ones one of our best longest sponsors and that is our good friends at bet online betonline.net is your number one source for all of your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season find all the latest football league developments game matchups news podcasts including this year's opening week's games bet online is also your continued source for all of your sports wagering information including live betting esports and scores the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite sports and events including mlb mma boxing and golf Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online, where the game starts. Just realizing I wanted to just say one other thing. In general, isn't it kind of nice? Like, you look at this Guardians team in general, and like I said, I think you don't look for an, an upgrade in the outfield. Unless something massive and obvious comes by, that's not... You, let, you run those three out there. 
you they have you know for various reasons and listen if straw or gonzalez don't work out they either of them profile great as a backup on the infield obviously third base is set second base is very clearly set first base if it's either nailer or if he's a dh that's pretty sad shortstop again i'm totally fine running back ahmed and especially because you know i I think Rokio is the guy there. I've talked about many times. The statistical comparison between him and Lindor is is interesting and fun. And, you know, you let Ahmed go out there and, and go. And if he plays great, great. If it's another Ahmed season, which is below average defense, league average bat, well, eventually you can move on to the young player. But I think shortstop and then, you know, catcher, depending on I, I'm totally to the point now where I'm like, okay, just resign hedges at, at four to five million and then hope that uh, by the end of June you have Naylor up and ready to go. It's so like for me it's a shortstop and maybe a DH. And I know Tito likes this rotating DH. I just don't think it works. <laughs> it's not been Owen Miller is not the answer. Uh, adding a big bat would be nice in some form. You know, if it was a uh, Walker, the first baseman from Arizona, who we talked about before that series, and if it's a Tani, who I talked about yesterday, if you could add some player who could give them a little more power, uh, maybe walk. They, you know, honestly, it's like Nolan Jones is kind of what they need. And I know you're like, oh, he's gonna sit here and stand for him again, but a, a guy who walks a lot and has power potential that's kind of what they need in that spot to add a little more balance to the overall lineup. That's, I mean, Nolan Jones is going to strike out a lot and he's going to walk a lot. He should hit for power. That's kind of what you need at that DH spot. And then maybe you can still keep the flexibility, but if you could acquire someone who's proven who can do that, I am all for that. Let's get into the win from Thursday, the sweep of the angels. It's rough. If you are an angels fan, let's just be honest about that. It is very rough. This team just continues to kind of putter along and, what, eight straight years they're not going to make the postseason now, uh, something like that. It's 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 rough. It is a brutally rough team because they spend money but not well. And looking at them, I just can't help but think about, like, giving pull holes to no-conceived contract. Uh, going back all the way to, like, C.J. Wilson, who was hurt as a starter. J, uh, Justin Upton, who I believe they were paying to not play for them. Uh, Rendon, who's been hurt. It's like they miss out on the top tier and end up spending on the lesser tier. And it's a mess for them. So in this game, yes, Oscar Gonzalez had home run number nine. That's, what, five this month? Which, again, very positive sign. Emerging power. He always had great power in the minors. We just hadn't seen it quite white in games so far until this one. Jose Ramirez with his 27th the game winner. And what's kind of fascinating about that is like in that same at bat he swung at a pitch that nearly hit him. And then luckily Tapera left one high and in the middle of the plate and he just crushed it uh, to pick up the win. Or you know essentially to give the Guardians a win. Sorry I just had a, a brain uh, synapse firing about what I wanted to talk about actually a little bit in segment one we'll talk about in segment two because we're talking about the game so that and more ties into that and then for cleveland like they this was an, an odd game as someone who likes to look at box scores uh and, and i'm just gonna state this people come on and get mad that i'm too analytical that's this podcast that's how this team was built and i was very curious about how teams were built and the guardians and all teams are very analytically based now uh so yeah it, i look at numbers because they provide for me value so if it's not your thing, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, we can, you know, it's move on, pick another show, I guess. Hopefully I can make it interesting, even if it's not your thing. I know we have people like Justin out there uh, who I've had many interactions with on the YouTube, but uh, I know it's not necessarily his thing. So in this game that they won, uh, neither side had walks. Don't see that very often. And for Quantrell, it's not quite his dominant Self, it's still a very good start. Seven innings, eight hits, zero walks, six strikeouts, three earned runs. I mean, he'd been one a runner or less for like the last month and a half, so it's a little bit more, but he's still quite good in this one. Uh, who reached base multiple times? Well, you had Jose Ramirez with two hits, you had three hits by Oscar Gonzalez, you had three hits by Jimenez, and then Freeman got hit by a pitch, which is the closest you get to a walk in this one, along with having two hits himself. Nice to see him having a multi hit game. 
uh, extra base hit that we did not mention was Straw with the double. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. So doing the box score bingo. Cleveland had 13 hits and a hit batter. That's 14 opportunities. That should be four to five runs. They got five. The other side of things, 10 hits should be three runs, maybe four. Three runs it is. Hey, it all matches up in this one. Three stars for me. Uh, Oscar Gonzalez for three hits and a home run. Jose Ramirez for two hits and a game-winning home run. And then you really have to debate, you know, Freeman with the two hits and the hit batter, three hits by Jimenez. But I think, end of the day, Quantrill going seven innings, still only in the 90 pitches, three earned runs. You'll take that three earned runs in seven almost every game. Nice win by the Guardians. Now I want to take us into the fifth inning. So this is what hit me, and it was an idea that I thought was fun, and I'm curious if anyone else thinks it's a fun idea. I don't know why this really tickled my fancy, but it's a, just another layer you can add into a game. Either win okay, this game, honestly, the Angels game, I didn't get. I watched the highlights because it happened when I was teaching. I have a day job. But I went back, watched the highlights, watched the condensed game, watched a few key innings like all the way through. And before I did that, though, I was, you know, I, I just went and looked at it. I went and saw how it turned out, perused the box score. I like to go through every inning. I always like to do that. And I had this idea of what happens if, as someone who goes through inning by inning, A, does anyone else do that? Let me know on my Twitter, at JeffMLBDraft. And second, uh, th- this is the idea that came. That if you were going through watching a baseball game as a fan, what happens, what would be, if I give you one delete per game, what would you delete? What would be your, I'll call it the Ellis elimination, you know, go through and uh, get my name on something here. I don't know why I'm doing uh, quotation marks, but if you could go through and eliminate one thing, delete one moment, and the and you can only do it once, and you have to kind of start at the beginning and go through. For me, as I was going through, the reason I, I kind of thought about this was, you know, I'm kind of going through the, the lineup, we get to the fifth inning, and Jimenez singles, Freeman singles, so you got men on first and third, Hedges hits into a double play. So Cleveland's able to get one run back, but they had a great chance to tie this game up because that immediately after that double play was was a double. So if you eliminate the Hedges double play, you assume single, single, then you get the double. So I think on that double that you get Jimenez and possibly Freeman across. Uh, if not, you have second and third with nobody out. And you got Quan, uh, Ahmed, and, and in second and third, nobody out. Ahmed, it'd be harder for him to hit in that double play. <laughs> and then you get Jose. Like it, it just, it gives them a real chance. Where honestly, probably it, like that ties the game. Uh, I'm, I don't know. Like I said, for me, it was just a fun idea, and it really hit me. I'm like, oh, I'm kind of curious to go through and be like, you know, the, for me, the rule was I have to start the first inning, kind of go through and decide where it is that I make the elimination. Where am I going to cut this play and see how it affects the game? Maybe this ends up being bad for them. Maybe it shifts everything off and that home run doesn't happen. Obviously, we can't really replicate the situation, but it's a fun idea. And like I said, for me, it was a just, I was going through and I'm like, man, wouldn't it be nice if that one play didn't happen? It's like, oh, what happens if every game I go through? So we do our box score bingo. We talk about who reached base twice. We do our three stars of every game. I might throw in an Alice elimination from time to time. And uh, make sure to hit me up on Twitter. Do you like this? Is this fun? Is it something you're going to do? And uh, also let me know what your eliminations would be. Let's talk Zach Plesak. CAA, one of the biggest biggest agencies, c- cut him, essentially. They got rid of all ties to Zach Plesak. And it's interesting because normally we see this when a big bad thing happens. Plesak has been a slow bleed. <laughs> has been... Uh, a minor thing every year that has looked poorly on him but he's also okay so if we go back to the big moment if we go back to when it all started with him the what got him in trouble with his teammates was the COVID situation with him and Clevenger and then after that what arose was his teammates got mad he got sent to the minors and then his response in that moment was to follow up by um, doing a video that was really ill-advised. To me, of anything he has done, that is the worst of it, that he sat down and recorded a whole video where uh, the Cleveland blaming media in general, blaming everyone else while he drove without a seatbelt and recorded a video. It was a pretty poor look. 
Since then, it's like, okay, he took off his shirt too quickly and broke his hand, and he punched the ground when he was mad. To me, that's the least offensive. It's like, I think we've all had a moment where you've, like, gotten mad and, and punched a ground or a wall. Uh, it was poor luck, but it, it's interesting because he's not a guy who has a massive issue. And because of that whole issue where he was sent to the minors, the compromise was the Guardians got essentially an extra year of team control that they wouldn't have got if he hadn't been set down. And instead, he is arbitration eligible early. They, they treated him like he was an arbitration player this year, even though he technically wasn't. So he's making seven figures. So they're giving up a decent chunk of money because they view him as not worth it. So I'm like, is there more going, beyond, going on behind the scenes? Is there something we don't know yet? I am unsure. I don't know what is going to occur. But when I look at the whole picture of it, when I look at what's going on, it's just interesting to see a player get released. It's interesting to see that same player uh, let go by an agency when he's making him money and he hasn't done anything massively wrong. So, yeah, I'm, you know, we'll see. I assume someone's going to sign him. Why wouldn't you want to add him and get your 10% or whatever it is exactly the agent gets? Because it's, it's free money. He's already into arbitration. Uh, so he, it's going to be, I'm curious. It's just unusual. It's so unusual that it stuck out for me in this particular case. I mean, he's a knucklehead, but he's not a criminal. I mean, at the end of the day, it essentially comes down to that. Uh, you know, I, I, maybe I have too much from when, you know, you can go back. It's really interesting when he was a sophomore, him and Eric Lauer were the, the pitchers in the Mac. They were maybe the best combo of pitchers the Mac had seen in a few years, and he just couldn't stay healthy. And I thought he was a really interesting pick. You know, if you go back a few years, Adam Lieberman leaves, who we had on the show. You know, I, I was talking about him, about the guys that I was very curious about that I viewed as like lower-rung players. And Cam Hill, Zach Plesak were those guys. Hopefully Plesak can find a little more stability overall. I'm not exactly sure what is the holdup with him. But he is in a situation currently where I don't know if he's – what's going to go on with that hand. I don't know if we'll see him pitch again this season. I don't know what's going to happen, but I am a little concerned in the greater scheme of things because he has, you know, is there something more going on? I don't know. Let me know your thoughts. Uh, we're going to take our last break and then we're going to come back uh, and discuss the Elvis Andrews quote, because I think we still have to discuss it, even though again, maybe it held a little more value yesterday. Okay, in case you missed it, this is the quote that Elvis Andrews said. And here's the thing. Historically, Elvis Andrews, when he was with Texas, was very good against the Guardians, or back then the Indians. He was always strong against them. But this this quote still, I thought they would be a little more fired up today after, uh, you know, someone saying they've been playing perfect in, until now. If we keep winning series, we know sooner or later they're going to crumble the closer we get. Thursday is going to be a real ga good game for us to go out there and put a statement. And they did. Like, at the end of the day, uh, he they went out and made a statement. <laughs> that was a, a statement game for them. I thought there'd be a little more, uh, you know, to it. But it, it was definitely not a pretty game. Like I said, we're going to get into it on the second podcast I'm recording today, and that's going to be for Friday's show. But when you're looking at a quote like that, why would you say that? You really want to do anything to motivate the other team? It, it seems very silly. Now, I... When you sell the promotion of Hunter Gaddis, I I liked it. I, I know obviously it didn't go well, and we'll get into it more, but I still think Gaddis has the potential to pitch a decade in the majors. I think he's more likely a reliever. I have said when I look at him and you look at what he has done, that the profile, he reminds me a little bit of Eli Morgan with a little more velocity and size. And I think maybe he's a long-term, he's a reliever. I think he can be a very good reliever, but... You know, so far, the the one thing that you can track through the minors and in college, he's always had that high home run rate, which is part of what Cleveland seems to like. They seem to prefer guys. And I, you can go back and listen to my interview with Hunter Gaddis where I ask him about this. And I tell him my theory on why teams seem to prefer a ball, you know, why the Guardians seem to like those pitchers who put the ball in the air more and don't seem to care about home run rate uh, overall. It's interesting because it does seem to be a very Guardians thing, right? Like their whole offense is not power hitters. It's guys who put the ball on the ground more. It's more of like singles hitters, and they seem to go for the opposite when it comes to pitchers, which are guys who will give up home runs. They're not afraid of those types at all. So, yeah, we know that Gaddis was up for this one. 
Pilkington went down. He'll come up Saturday for the extra man in the double header. Xavion Curry will be up at some point because we assume he lines up to start Saturday uh, for Cleveland because it's, you know, it's a stretch, right? They have five games now against the Twins. The weird Friday to Monday, I assume Monday was originally supposed to be an off day, but because they've missed so many games, they have so many of these makeup games that there is no off day now. They are just going all the way through this whole season. And, you know, five games against the Twins. And then it's the White Sox again. And when the White Sox, who are currently in second place, aren't facing Cleveland, they get the Tigers. It's a little bit easier for them. So they do have a legitimate chance to gain a lot of ground in this one. But, yeah, I think I still think Cleveland's got this division. I am still a believer that they have the right mix to get there. They have time, you know, I don't know if I'll say time in the hitting. They have good hitters. You know, there's a clear top six on that team in terms of their bats. They have really strong bullpen. And they have a good starting rotation top three. Hopefully we'll see someone like Savalde rebound and come back and be healthy enough to contribute. Uh, he's, you know, getting closer. We don't know about Plesak, but they got to figure out the rotation. And honestly, when you're looking at this team, you were talking about how you feel pretty confident about the line. At least I feel confident about the lineup. I'm like, ah, for I've spent the last half decade coming up with trades to acquire outfielders. I'm not looking at outfielders necessarily this offseason. Starting pitching, I still wonder about. And yes, they have the young players. I still think both Curry and Gattis are probably long-term better served as relievers. i very curious what, you know, how they'll handle some of them. Espino hasn't been healthy. They don't have to add Bybee and Williams for a long time. Logan Allen might be the next pitcher up. I'm going to be curious to see how they handle some of these young pitchers. But trading for a veteran, uh, I would certainly be down for. I think there's some smartness in making that move. Uh, This is a near playoff team. It would be fun to see them. They have such depth. Maybe go make a play for next year. I'm not saying you have to go all in, but improving your team around the margins could do a lot. I'm Jeff Ellis. This is the Lockdown Guardians podcast for Thursday. We uh, Again, I apologize. I, I don't know if I to blame Windows 10 or blame OBS, but I mean, I'm more annoyed that I sat there and stayed up super late and had nothing to show for it. So I apologize for all those issues uh, and also for trying to take what I already recorded and repackage it. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's a new podcast, a new day, but trying to take what I already wrote, put together, and make a show out of it. I hope everyone enjoyed. I want to thank everyone for listening, rating, and reviewing. We're over 600 subscribers, and I appreciate you all. Uh, For the most part, it is a very kind group. And as I end every show, go, go, Guardians, go.